Hello, and welcome to another edition of From the Source. I'm Elizabeth Johnson, your host. Today, I'm thrilled to have as my special guest, Nassau County Legislator Ellen Birnbaum. Legislator Birnbaum has served three terms representing the 10th District, which includes Great Neck, Manhasset Hills, the Village of North Hills, parts of Albertson, Garden City Park, Harrick's, Manhasset, New Hyde Park, and Searingtown. Prior to being elected to the legislature, Ellen served as director of the Office of Intermunicipal Coordination for the town of North Hampstead, where she helped the villages, schools, and special districts within the town save money for taxpayers through shared services and cooperative projects. Here to speak about what's going on in our neck of the woods is Ellen Birnbaum. Welcome, Ellen, and thank you for coming on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So our viewers would like to know a little bit more about you. Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. So I've lived in Nassau County my whole life. I grew up on the South Shore in Long Beach. Oh, wow. Yeah, and my dad is still there, so I love going back there, especially in the summers. But I've been living in Great Neck for the past 38 years. Okay. And um, I raised my children there. I have two daughters and a son, and actually I have a granddaughter now. Oh, nice, congratulations. Uh, thank you. And um, I've always been involved in public service. And as you said, prior to becoming the legislator, I worked for the town of North Hempstead for many years. And um, I love to be involved in my community. And I'm in public service to help my constituents and to make Nassau County a great place to live and work. Which it is, it is yeah. very much. So tell me, how did you get involved in politics? You know. Well, as I said, I grew up in Long Beach, and Long Beach is a hotbed of politics. I remember working on campaigns from an early age. Oh, really? Yeah. So you were a campaign aide? Yeah, I worked on uh, presidential elections, local elections, okay. and in fact, um, at my high school graduation, the speaker was um, a local state senator at the time, Karen Burstein, and okay. I really admired uh, seeing a young woman who was an elected official then. Mm -hmm. So I think that stuck with me a little bit. And then I went on to college, and I was very involved in um, NYPIRC, New York Public Interest Research Group, and okay. we did a lot of studies, um, uh, polls, and uh, I majored in consumer economics and public policy, and I was just always interested in policy. And I worked on many campaigns over the years in Great Neck mm -hmm. and locally in Nassau County, and then I had an opportunity to run, and I did. Oh, that's wonderful. So when you graduated from school, was uh, were you just continuing on, on uh, as working on campaigns, or did you uh, start in the public sector, private sector? Well, actually, that's a good question, because when I graduated from school, I, I decided I wanted to get an MBA degree. So I went and I studied finance at NYU, right. which I believe is your alma mater. Yes, it is, it is. So I got a degree there. And then after I started living in Great Neck, I, st I was raising my children and I got involved in the politics in the community okay. and I worked on many people's campaigns there. Okay. And I think one of the people I met soon after was Lee Seaman. Yes, so yes, a part of our town of yes, North Hampstead. Yes, town of North Hampstead. She was a big inspiration to me. She and is. She's I got amazing. involved in a lot of community events and one thing led to another. And Yeah, she's, she's great. Um, so. 
You know, you said that your background is in consumer economics. Now, I know uh, economists, I married one, <laughs> and, and public po uh, policy as well as finance. Um, and you're also on the finance committee for Nassau County. Um, so I know that Nassau County had issues and, uh, you know, we were being uh, monitored by the state. So could you tell us a little bit more about what's going on, and especially now? because are we past that monitoring stage? Um, nope. nope. <laughs> we okay. still have NIFA watching everything and approving contracts. Okay. So I am the ranking member on the Finance Committee. Okay. So I do scrutinize any of the um, bills that come before the legislature dealing with, uh, with um, purchasing and expenses, uh, outside contracting. I also am a member of the Budget Committee. Okay. So I do look carefully over where the monies are being spent. And I will say that under the previous administration, there was a huge deficit mm -hmm. and a lot of borrowing. And uh, with the current administration, I think the finances have improved. Okay. And um, yes, one of the main methods of getting in revenue for the county is sales tax. Okay. So right now, um, there's been new legislation in the state for income, for um, internet sales tax coming our way because mm. a lot of retail stores are not really generating the revenue as in the past. Right. So the internet sales revenue should help the county. And um, I think also in terms of jobs, the um, workforce has been scaled back a bit with a lot of um, attrition. So that has helped in terms of the budget, but I think now um, positions are getting filled again. Yes. Well, to know. create efficiencies in the government so that Nassau County could do the jobs without having to contract out in certain areas. Okay. So do you believe that the, this has uh, really been spearheaded by Laura Curran in her current role, or was that already just... Uh, I do think Laura Kern has um, been at the helm and making a difference. I think that uh, she is careful in where the county is spending the money. Yes. Uh, for instance, she did not want new signs created for all the parks with her name on it. Right. She, you know, she tries to cut back when she can and uh, there's also more transparency in government now. There was the creation of an office of inspector general. So oh. contracts do get scrutinized, and um, all the disclosure statements that are filled out by vendors really get looked at. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the the spending has been um, tightened. Right. Yeah. So we're on the road to recovery. I believe so. Yes. Okay. It's a process. <laughs> it is. It is a process. It took how many years to, for us to get into this mess yeah. and to get out of it? It's not going to be overnight, which you know kind of leads me to actually this question because it's a personal question. You know, I mean, each year um, is different, and. Um, you know, I, I see that it takes a while for any elected official to get up to speed, and, it, and it's usually hyper speed. Uh, this is what I've seen. But to have only two years to accomplish this and then go and, and be reelected, do you feel that perhaps, you know, a slightly longer term, like like the county executive? Is, is, she is yeah, four years. Four years, right. And all the legislators, uh, the term of office is two years, and That's we right. all get elected the same year. Right. So, for instance, this November is an election year for the local elections, right. and I do think it's a little strange that it's a two-year term and everybody runs at the same time, so there could be a complete changeover. Right, and all that work could be and done. And when you have a two-year term, basically your first year is doing hard work, and then the second year, I, I still, of course, am working hard, but it's another year that you have to spend time campaigning and um, working on your reelection. So right. I, I think perhaps the term could be lengthened, but mm -hmm. 
that's the way it is. <laughs> right. Uh, what do you know? What it would take for something to be changed, like the term, be changed? I, I just curious because I don't know. I believe it would probably have to be a referendum for the I voters see. to decide. Okay. Because I think that's the way it's been uh, that I've observed in local villages when they try to change terms. Okay. Interesting. Thank yeah. you for that. That's a, a matter of perspective. I did. I haven't. I just feel like. The term is too short. Yeah, it's well, just, when you have to change the charter, the charter of the legislature determines all the rules. And then if you're doing a charter change, you would have to, like if a position is appointed and you want to switch it to elected or vice versa, it would have to go to the voters. Oh, I see. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, so under your leadership, which we are so grateful for, I can't Thank tell you, you. Uh, you know, the opening of the sixth precinct came to pass. That was monumental. It was so upsetting that it closed. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, so how were you able to, to do that um, and get that accomplished? Because that was massive. It was seven years of adv advocacy. Um, I, I was opposed, and I think almost everybody in this area was, to the merger when it took place under the so-called cost savings measure by the previous administration. Right. So the third and the sixth precinct got merged, and the sixth precinct here on Community Drive sort of sat fallow. It was used for um, highway monitoring, right. highway um, patrol. But uh, the third became a supersized precinct because it was really two precincts merged into one. So we didn't have our local precinct house to go to. Uh, for the years that it was merged, every time there was some kind of vote dealing with the police and purchasing more items for public safety, which of course everyone is for, um, I would make a statement that I will be in favor of this, but I think we should once again look at the reopening of the 6th Precinct. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the past administration, I tried meeting with the county executive who was not interested and the former police commissioner, acting police commissioner as well, right. and he wasn't very receptive. When the current administration came into office two years ago, um, I know County Executive now Laura Kern had talked about it when she was being reelected that she was in favor of reopening the precinct. Yes. And the current police commissioner, Patrick Ryder, as well. So it was just a matter of time, and I also was not going to let that drag on. Um, over the years, I had rallies. We stood in front of the uh, legislature building, we stood in front of the police precinct. And I reminded people that this building is still there and deteriorating because work really hadn't been done on it over the years. And uh, this year, I kept pushing and pushing, saying it's now into the second year of this current administration. When are we reopening this precinct? And finally, in April, uh, after lots of negotiations, uh, we were able to announce, I remember it was April 4th, because April 5th is my anniversary, so yeah. I said, oh, this is a great present. I'm standing here today, it was a beautiful day, announcing that it would be reopened. And in fact, the very next Monday or Tuesday, well, actually that day, they started to prepare the ground to bring in these trailers. So right. if you go by now, you see they're operating in a double trailer and work commenced in the building that's being gut renovated because okay. I think it was built in the 60s so yeah, it just like needed this. a total renovation and I took a tour recently and it's being painted new HVAC system new flooring everything's being done in it and um, the goal is to reopen the building in October right so. and but there's even more cost savings in there because isn't the police a unit of the police, I don't know what, what it was, that they're doing the renovations themselves. The county is actually the doing county. it internally. They didn't hire outside people to do the work. So the county is doing it, yes. Right. And uh, for less than a million dollars, they're renovating the building and they're, they're working on it daily. Yeah, I, I definitely, 
I can truly say I definitely see a more of a police presence within the area. They're out there all the time. I mean, they were out there before. Yeah, of course they were but, monitoring our mm -hmm. area and there was no real spike in crime, so to speak, because no. our area was covered, but it's just a better morale for the officers. Yes. And um, I think better services for the local constituents who could go there and feel comfortable walking into a building now and talking to police. Uh, we have our local pop offices who cover this area and really get to know the people. So, yes. yeah. They're very nice, very nice, and very, um, uh, very friendly. Yeah, you know? well, because the two that cover this area actually live in the community, so yeah. they're part of the community. and. Um, they, they understand if there's a problem. If anybody talks to me about a traffic issue or um, any kind of issue, I, I will just reach out and they're there. They'll meet with the person. Yes, they have spoken at various uh, organizations to, you mm -hmm. know, kind of uh, highlight, you know, what needs to be um, watched out for. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, they're great. We, we no, we, really we're very like fortunate. We have great people working for us, and um, yeah, they, they're doing a, a, a terrific job. Do you uh, know who is going to be, who's the uh, precinct commander for the third precinct? Um, yes, somebody actually was just assigned to it uh, about a week ago. Okay. Um, I, so, uh, mm, I think it was Abruzzo was going to. He's be, not. He's he's stepped he's not, down. He's not the commission. Uh, the precinct um, commander. Commander. No, there was somebody else put in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sure whoever it is is yeah, going to no, be great. He's, you know. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful. Well, I have to tell you that was a major accomplishment. I mean, it. The people of the area, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so right next door to the uh, current precinct, uh, there is uh, a Macy's property, which I'm sure you've heard about, and um, that they have brought in a, a developer, uh, Brookfield Properties, uh, to, uh, I guess, uh, make use of the 21 acres that is uh, there next to um, the precinct and mm -hmm. the parks. Um, do you know what's going on uh, with that? I believe that area is under the jurisdiction of the town of North Hempstead. So I think yes. the town is in a better position to speak about that. Um, uh, I just heard as you did, and I'm not really sure what's what what's happening right now. Okay. There's been so many different rumors over the years right. of what's going in there. So I, I Well, I, I know that I have met with the um, developers and uh, uh, as the chamber president and uh, um, they're very, very uh, nice people who are, you know, looking to make use of the 21 acres that is really, you know, it's it's just asphalt right now um, but uh, I don't think that they're ready yet to actually un unveil but they're listening to the community mm -hmm. which is a, a, a nice thing to have so um, can you talk to us about the local law that you've introduced into legislature uh, limiting how long an acting department head can serve before being confirmed by the county? And why did you put the? Why did you bring this forward? Thank you for asking that because I'm really proud of that piece of legislation. Um, of course. In the past, we had an acting assessor at the county. Yes. And. This person was really unapproachable. I tried to have meetings with him, and um, I realized that when I looked more into who he was, he wasn't qualified to be an assessor. Oh, he wow. didn't have the basic qualifications as written by the county charter to serve as assessor, and that was why he was in an acting position. And he was like a figurehead of the department, mm -hmm. and he had been in it for years. So that was just mind boggling to me that somebody could serve as an acting department head without being qualified. 
Right. So when I looked into it, there was no term in which the department had had to be confirmed after being named by the county executive. Really? Really. And we also had, I don't know how many people realize this, the police uh, chief was an acting commissioner. Yes. Crumpter, yeah. acting commissioner. Right. He never took the job as commissioner. Oh, he was never brought up to be confirmed as commissioner. So these were two prominent people in the county who were not in, you know, the official roles that they should be in. And I realized that it shouldn't be. So um, I worked with the uh, a council and we formulated this legislation that limited the the period of time to six months after being named as a Excellent. department head in which you had to come to the legislature for confirmation. Right. No, absolutely. I, I, I was wondering that myself because the acting head of the police department, though I think he I was qualified, I was wondering why didn't he either step up or step down. You know, it just, it didn't make sense. So. Well, it also has to do with the salary assigned to the job. Oh. So okay. perhaps, you know, there might have been a reason there. I see. Okay. Interesting. So now this is actual law that has this passed? This is law. It passed, yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Well, thank you. Because <laughs> that's uh, yeah. very important. And now, but th that position with the assessment is no longer a um, voted position, right? They don't vote. That I mean, changed years ago. Years ago. Okay. Uh, it was a referendum. Okay. And it was made, um, yeah, an appointed a commissioner. So it's not an elected position. Yeah. Right. Do you feel like there there needs to be more a reform on what is currently the law in Nassau County? No, I, th I think the qualifications for an assessor is pretty much laid out thoroughly, and mm -hmm. I, I know that there was a search done before they were able to fill the spot, and I think that it's it has to be a qualified person. It shouldn't be a political person. It should be somebody who is really qualified with their background to be an assessor. It's an important position. Yes, definitely. Well, how do you feel about the whole reassessment process? I feel that the tax roll had been frozen for a very long time mm -hmm. and it was not accurate and I think it's a process now where they're getting to true valuations and uh, I think residents, when they receive the new value that market value assigned to their house, they have the same opportunity as in any other year to challenge it. Mm -hmm. And if they don't think it's correct, it, and there's very good reason it will be adjusted. So I think it was important to redo the role and have a more accurate reflection of what market values are. And that's how taxes are based in Nassau County. It goes by property tax. And it's not necessarily that taxes are going up because they're not. It's just a revaluation of all the properties. Well, with this climate, the economic climate today, which I'm sure that you realize that you know our values are a little bit softer and they're constantly changing, which to me is the biggest challenge of that particular role. I mm -hmm. wouldn't want that job for anything <laughs> because it's tough, you know, and um, <clears throat> part, part and parcel because of the current uh, tax laws and SALT, mm -hmm. you know, right. making it even, even harder. Um, so, uh, it's, it seems to me that any resident who is a property owner should actually constantly question that evaluation. They should, and um, what we've been told is that with the new revaluation, half the people, it's approximately 50%, half went up, half went down. People, some people were overpaying, so everybody has to look at their market value, and then there's a multiplier that gives you the assessed value, and then the right. taxes are based on that value. Wonderful. Um, so having raised a family on Long Island, you have now introduced a new group in your next stage of life uh, into the area for grandparenting. Tell, tell us a little bit about that and how you're involved with okay. it. Okay, well, 
As I mentioned, I did become a new grandparent. Um, I have a seven-month-old granddaughter. Oh, and um, I happened to be speaking to a constituent who had an idea for a workshop, a program that she wanted to run on grandparent power. Mm -hmm. She felt that grandparents now might have a disconnect with their grandchildren because of all the electronic devices and uh, the use of social media. Yes. And there's not as much verbal communication and imparting knowledge from the grandparent to the child and learning from each other because of the use of electronic devices and mm -hmm. smartphones. So she said she would really like to run a series of programming. And when we talked about it, I thought this was a terrific idea. And I had recalled that when I was a young parent, there was a program run through the Great Neck Park District for our new parents and their children. And I said, you know, I don't remember hearing anything about a grandparenting program. So this sounds perfect to me. So. I put her in touch and we sat down and we met with representatives from the Great Neck Park District and there's a building in Great Neck called Great Neck House mm -hmm. that is open to the public and they run programs there. And um, I will mention that this person is uh, Fran Spilke Epstein and she's an author and a lecturer and she worked on a curriculum and the Park District loved it and it just started last week. So there was the first meeting and she actually brought in a couple of guest speakers. The, uh, one was from the district attorney's office talking about um, the problems with young kids being on the internet and sometimes trusting other people when they interact and yes. giving them personal information. Right. Which could lead to a dangerous situation. Um, and then there were two representatives from a program in Great Neck that talked about all the different social media platforms that uh, kids are using. And, and adults, and just went over, you know, what you have to be careful of when you do your social media. Yes. So, but there's that was the first meeting, and then another one's coming up with um, a, a, a psychologist talking about when grandparents have to uh, assume the role almost as a parent if there's a problem in the family, mm. and. Uh, there's all sorts of interesting programs planned. It's an eight week, eight, eight weeks in the in the session. That sounds like a wonderful program, and it should be rolled out through the Nassau County. <laughs> well, we'll see how it takes yeah. off, and maybe there could be other groups modeled on this one. It's amazing because so many grandparents do have to take that role right. sometimes, whether it be uh, economic or um, illness. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You just never know. Mm -hmm. But that's great. Oh, thank you so much. That's wonderful. I hope it does uh, uh, roll out. So, in the future. Do you, what do you see uh, yourself doing? Do you want to continue uh, at the, just the le le Nassau County Legislature, or would you consider a, a, you know, a higher office? Uh, the, you're asking me that after I watched the debates last night. <laughs> uh, Sometimes we need help. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, I am very, happy and satisfied working here in the county and I had worked at the town of North Hempstead beforehand so I'm familiar with government at the town level. Um, my husband is very involved in the village where we live, the village of Great Neck. Mm -hmm. So we're staying put in this community and uh, I will be happy to serve as long as I am doing a, a good job there at the county. And you're doing a great job. Thank you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today, but I would love to have you come back on the show. I hope that you'll be able to do that for us. Oh, sure. I would love to. Okay. Well, that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching From the Source. Stay tuned next time for more in-depth interviews with members of your community.